All right, everybody, welcome to our second edition uh, from the cutting room floor. These videos where I'm giving you just a little bit more information on the book of Revelation that I don't have time to include in my sermons each week, uh, or a little bit more information that might be helpful for you as you study the book of Revelation on your own, or maybe even just are helpful for you as you're trying to make sense of how I'm approaching the book and understanding how the book unfolds. You remember, if you watched the first video, we talked about these four main views on how the book of Revelation is structured and how it works and what it is meant to symbolically show. And we looked at them mainly in relation to the uh, historical timeline. We talked about like the preterist view that thinks the book of Revelation pretty much is all about symbolically uh, the a series of events that took place, climatic events that took place in the early church in that very brief span of time shortly after the death, resurrection, and enthronement of Jesus Christ. Or there's the futurist view that thinks the book of Revelation is giving us a symbolic look at the events that are yet to come in the future when Christ returns to consummate the kingdom and to finalize God's purposes for judgment and redemption. Or there's this idealist view that I tend to come from, and many others, that look at the book of Revelation as giving us a symbolic look behind the curtain, behind the scenes, at all of life in this full span of time between God's or Christ's first victory and his death, resurrection, and throne, and his final victory uh, when he comes again. And the thing is, it's not just one uh, look at that history, but it's multiple looks at that history, or multiple visions that show us that history. We talked about this on Sunday, that that tends to be how apocalyptic literature works in the Bible, outside of the Bible, right? You get multiple visions, multiple dreams, multiple specta uh, perspectives on sometimes the same span of history, which leads to this point that the book of Revelation, from the idealist perspective, doesn't necessarily unfold chronologically in some linear fashion, one event after another, after another, after another, from chapter 6 all the way to the end of the book. But rather, in keeping with apocalyptic literature, sometimes well, we'll get one vision, and then the next vision will cycle back around to maybe that same period of history. And that's what I want to kind of dive into just a little bit deeper there here uh, in this video. We looked at the first cycle of the seven seals, and I made this claim that when we come to the end of this cycle, it looks like we're coming to the end of history and to the coming of the one on the throne and the Lamb. And I actually want to show you that that's how all the cycles work. Uh, so I get my chart out here again, and hopefully you can make sense of my artwork here. But the book of Revelation from chapter 6 on, or at least from chapter 6 through 16, is structured with three dominant cycles of seven. Uh, you got the seven seals. This is my scroll with seven seals on it. Seven trumpets and seven bowls of God's wrath, right? And... Within each of these cycles of seven, seven seals, trumpets, bowls, there's a similar structure, a similar unfolding of each one. You get the first six unfolding of those things, and then there's an interlude or a pause where we get a word of promise or a word of assurance or a word of comfort to the saints, to God's people. And then all these cycles end up, we circle back around, we get the seventh seal, trumpet, and bowl, and in each instance of the seventh one coming to fruition, we're also told that it's accompanied by flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and an earthquake. Which begs the question, okay, what's the deal with these flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and these earthquakes that accompany all these seven signs? And to get at that, I guess look at it this way. Think, when, was, when have we already in the book of Revelation seen flashes of lightning and peals of thunder? Think back to chapter 4, when we're given this glimpse uh, into the heavenly throne room, and we see the one who's seated on the throne, right? The sea of glass in front of the throne. And coming from the throne are what? Peals of lightning, flashes of thunder. In other words, what seems like what you have at the end of each of these cycles are these signs that accompany the arrival of the ones on the throne as they arrive on the scene. And the thing is, this is not exclusive to the book of Revelation. Actually, this shows up in multiple places throughout the Bible. Like, think about in the book of Exodus, when God is showing up to introduce himself 
to the people that he's just delivered out of Egypt, right? The Israelites. And they meet up at Mount Sinai, where God is going to give them their covenant charter, the book of the law. So Moses ascends up Mount Sinai. God descends onto Mount Sinai. And when he comes down onto Mount Sinai, what happens? Right? The mountain is enveloped in darkness. And there are flashes of lightning, peals of thunder. And as the book of, Re of Hebrews tells us, right, that whole mountain shook, almost like an earthquake. Or... Think about the book of Ezekiel, when the prophet Ezekiel is standing on the banks of the Kabar Canal with the exiles in Babylon, and he catches this vision in chapter 1 of the coming of the glory of God to be a refuge for his people there in exile, right? With the coming of the vision of the glory of God, he also sees flashes of lightning, peals of thunder. In other words, this is a common thing. When God shows up onto the scene, he's often accompanied by flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and earth-shaking events. So, surprise, surprise, at the end of each of these cycles, which bring us to the end of history in their own unique way, we get flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, earthquake, signs that accompany the arrival of God onto the scene. So let's look more specifically at how these uh, unfold. Uh, we looked at a bit of, we looked at at least seals one through six this past Sunday, and we saw at the end of seal six, right, the sun and the moon are becoming darkened, the stars are falling out of their, uh, their places, the earth is shaking, and everybody, whether it's the kings of the earth, the great ones, the generals, the rich and the powerful, they're all hiding themselves, pleading on the rocks of the caves to fall on them and hide them from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, because the great day of their judgment, of the great day of their wrath has come. And so who can stand? Right? Uh, certainly seeming to indicate, hey, we're, we're coming to the end of history here where God and the, and the Lamb are arriving onto the scene. But the question, who can stand, which leads us into this interlude. Well, actually, there's the symbolic number of 144,000 that God seals and that he spares and that he keeps. And that he wipes away all their tears and leads them into joy, into new creation, uh, which we'll get into in the next sermon. And then seal seven comes along, summing up the deal, flashes of lightning, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, the end. Except it leads right into now the second cycle, which gives us another look at that span of history. Uh, this time the six trumpets seem to resemble uh, the plagues that God sent upon Egypt to lead Egypt in repentance and to let his people free. And Egypt doesn't repent in a similar way. Uh, the inhabitants of the earth don't repent uh, in light of these plagues, at least not yet. After the sixth plague, there's an interlude, and we get another word of promise, or another little story about promise or an assurance to the saints uh, in the story of these two witnesses who suffer the wrath of God's enemies, but God delivers them from that, and he breathes new life into them, and he gives them victory over God's enemies, which actually does a really cool thing about, among these unrepentant nations. Hold on to that. We'll get there when we get there. But then we circle back around. We get trumpet number seven, accompanied by lightning, thunder, earthquake, and, this is in chapter 11, these kind of climactic statements that after all this is done, the, all these voices from heaven shout out, finally, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Or we give thanks to you, this is verse 17, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and you've begun your reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for, to judge the dead, the time for rewarding the servants, the prophets, the saints, and those who fear your name, the time for destroying all those who destroy the earth, has come. Certainly sounds kind of climactic, or like we're arriving at the end of history. Okay, but we're not done yet. we got another cycle. we got bowls, uh, the seven bowls. This one's a little bit more condensed, all in one chapter, in chapter 16. We get bowls one through six. We get a very brief interlude word of promise where God says, Behold, I'm coming. Kind of like one, like a thief in the night. So blessed is the one, blessed is he who stays awake and is alert to my coming. And then we get bowl seven, accompanied by lightning, thunder, and an earthquake. And um, announcements of God's final judgment on the wicked city, which he calls Babylon, which is kind of important. Um, We'll come back to that in a second. So there it is. There's your three main cycles uh, in the meat of the book, chapter 6 through 16. Uh, but I thought I'd just show you, I'd go ahead and round out the book and show you um, how the rest of the book fits in with those three cycles. Basically, between the trumpets and the bowls, 
um, in chapters 12, 13, 14, uh, we get, and 15, we get this little section that's also in a, seems like in a series of seven, where we get seven symbolic characters, dragon, woman, beast one, beast two, 144,000, uh, gospel angels or gospel proclaimers, and the Son of Man, who seems to be coming for his great harvest, again, at the end of that cycle of seven. And this is another story that pretty clearly takes us back to Christ's first victory, right? Where the Christ child is born of the woman, right? And then he ascends to the throne, uh, where he is given a kingdom to rule with a rod of iron, and in his ascension, the mighty dragon is cast out of heaven, right? That's that initial victory. Uh, but then he goes to wage war in this period of time against God's people, against the church, through the beast, beast one and beast two, um, until the time when the Son of Man comes to work his final harvest. That's that little snippet of things that happens in between the trumpets and the bowls. And after the bowls, after chapter 16, verses, and uh, chapter 17 through 20, uh, it's almost like we zoom in and an angel comes and says, hey, let me show you a little bit more closely this judgment of Babylon and the forces of evil. And that comes in two sections, chapter 17 through halfway through chapter 19, where we see the judgment of Babylon, which is symbolically portrayed as this prostitute that's riding on the back of one of these beasts. Okay, so we get that. And then chapters 19 through 20, we get the final judgment of uh, of the dragon and these two beasts, right? That mock trinity that we looked at from the last video. All right, so this is kind of a zoomed in look at the climactic uh, victory over the forces of evil and all those who are aligned with these forces of evil. And once they are eradicated from God's creation, once they are done away with, we are finally free uh, to lead into now this glorious new creation where God's heavenly throne room comes down uh, out of heaven to the earth, a restored earth, God makes his home with his people, wipes away tears from their eyes, and it is one glorious celebration then at that point. Okay? There you go. There's a little bit more into the structure of the book of Revelation. Gives you a little bit more how I'm looking at the big picture of the book. And oh, by the way, uh, if you even want um, a, a much better even look at this whole book structure, but from the same similar perspective, uh, go take a look at the Bible Project's videos on the book of Revelation. You certainly get a lot better artwork. Uh, and you'll see very similar stuff, but fleshed out in a little bit more detail. Just go onto YouTube and search Bible Project Revelation. You'll see two videos. Give them a look. I, I think you'll really enjoy them. Also, if you have any questions that you want me to unpack more, I certainly have the things I want to unpack. But if you have questions or issues you want me to dive deeper into, email them to me at asusic at gracebfc.org. We'll be happy to include them in the videos. Otherwise, see you at the next one.